Great. Welcome. I am going to hand this over to Hay to tell you about this workshop. I'm so happy you've all attended. And let's get started. Thank you so much for being here. Hello. Hey, take it away. Hello, and welcome to our presentation. I'm uh, Hai Kovanes. I'm co-chair of the Green Party Peace Action Committee, GPACS for short, and Ryan Swan, my colleague on GPACS, will be helping me present the material today. I'll do uh, the first half of it, and Ryan will do uh, the second and more interesting part. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen to show the slides, and. Uh, We'll get underway. So the name of this presentation is The Peace Pillar Revisited, New Challenges and Opportunities for Peace. This uh, graphic with the peace logo circled comes from the Green Party's homepage, and it represents the three main areas of activity of the Green Party. And our concern at the start of this presentation is talking about how the platform of the party addresses the peace pillar. We're also going to talk about the critical importance of world peace today. We're going to explore how technological advance is increasing the danger of war, but the same advances also have the potential for strengthening peacekeeping. And finally, we'll recommend some future directions for the US Green Party regarding peace issues. So what's wrong with the graphic I'm posting here? Underneath, you see the four pillars. And up above, you see the major sections of the current Green Party US platform. And everything is consistent up till you get to peace, because the fourth section of the existing platform is headed economic justice and sustainability. So there is a broken symmetry here. And we're going to talk about why that's a problem and, and what should be done. Section four turns out to be somewhat redundant to section two because social and economic justice are closely linked issues. Anyone who's thought about it sees that economic injustice leads to social injustice and vice versa. So it's not clear why they're separated as major headings of the platform. There is some reference to global peace issues in the platform, but it's buried fairly deep under other sections. Nuclear weapons and their danger are addressed in the democracy, foreign policy, defense budget subsection, and the militarization of space, also a serious threat to peace is talked about in democracy, foreign policy uh, subsection as well. So it's not that the platform is devoid of peace concerns, it's just that they're tucked away and they're not prominent. So the inconsistency issue exists not just because of the uh, fourth chapter, not aligned with the peace pillar, but even within the second chapter, there are subsections entitled environmental justice and economic justice, which are addressed in major sections of their own. So we have a, an inconsistency issue and we have uh, an organizational problem in the platform. So what do we think should be done? There should be a corresponding main section of the platform. There should be a, a big, elaborate section addressing the peace pillar. But this requires expanding and restructuring the platform. The current rules for platform revision don't readily accommodate a major rewrite of the platform. They're oriented toward minor amendments, tweaks, and adjustments. 
So we believe a work group should be established to undertake this project of making a major revision of the platform. And in fact, GPAX has worked on platform material for a dedicated piece section. The platform is important as we approach another presidential election. Uh, whoever the candidate will be, um, the, plat the platform will be subject to intense scrutiny. People will say, well, your platform says X or your platform says Y. So this is a, uh, a timely undertaking to go through the platform, rationalize it, and most importantly, give peace the appropriate amount of prominence. This is what we think the correspondence should look like. There should be a direct representation of the peace pillar in the GPUS platform. And the economic justice section can be handled as a wing of the social justice chapter. And that would give more opportunity to explain the interrelationships. Now, why do we think it should be prominent? Well, I don't have to explain this to members of GPAX or to many members of the party, but I'm going to go through my pitch anyway. Nuclear war is the greatest near-term danger facing the world. The other issues that Greens are concerned with are important, but most of them entail long-term suffering and harm to mankind. A nuclear war can kill you today. Actually, it can kill you within the next hour. It is a clear, present, severe danger to everyone in the world. And that is why it needs to be prominently addressed and urgently addressed. Technology advances aren't just making nuclear weapons more deadly than ever. They're introducing many other kinds of weapons that have high escalation potential. Escalation means moving from an initial conflict to a larger conflict to an even bigger conflict. If you think about fighting on a playground, someone will push someone in the chest and then someone will push harder back and then maybe land a punch. And before you know, there's a general brawl. That's what escalation is on the playground. But in the world, it's something that can end with hundreds of millions or even a billion people dead. And the technologies being introduced by the armed services and the weapons makers are making the world much more precarious because of increasing escalation danger. So there's an urgent need to find new solutions for conflict avoidance and resolution. GPAX is not alone in uh, sounding the alarm here prominent thinkers for decades, ever since 1945, have been ringing the alarm bell. Albert Einstein, Noam Chomsky, Yuval Harari, they're all saying this is a big deal. This is an urgent problem. The world has to solve it, or we won't even make it into the future. Civilization is, is at risk. The Union of Concerned Scientists, or Bolton of the Atomic Scientists, maintains something called the Doomsday Clock. It's a graphic representation of how close we are to the danger of global nuclear war. Right now, it's set to 90 seconds to midnight, which is as close as it's ever been, even closer than during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The defenders of nuclear deterrence generally use the argument that nothing has happened, and therefore it's working because we haven't had a nuclear war, obviously. But the history questions that argument because there have been many close calls. These are just a dozen. Of course, the most serious one was in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But many of them involved false alerts, mistaken identification of a missile launch, and former secretaries of defense have testified in documentaries and in, in their writing that many times the United States has been close to nuclear war. And it was just a, a cautious decision that averted the catastrophe. So 
if this is prudent policy, then uh, I think it needs to be re-examined. We are basically spinning the roulette wheel of nuclear disaster by engaging in arms racing, by pursuing hegemonic dominance, full spectrum dominance is what the military calls it. It's just chasing a dream of being able to rule the world by force. By abandoning diplomacy, we're closing off avenues for peaceful resolution of conflicts. We are involved in a major proxy war in Ukraine against the nuclear armed power. It's, I call it a proxy war because without our financial and military support, the war would stop. And the reason it's continuing is we are inflicting harm on uh, Russia. Again, a nuclear armed power that can resort to the ultimate weapon if it so chooses. Let's take a closer look at these escalation risks. Arms racing is not just an abstraction. Today, the United States has established entirely new branches of its military in order to seek technological advantage. It's established a US Cyber Command, which has military personnel developing and exercising weapons that can attack foreign computer systems. It has, the, the US has established a space force, which uh, curiously uses a Star Trek sort of emblem in their uh, medallion. And the purpose of the space force is to militarize orbital space, to put up not just reconnaissance systems, but potentially anti-satellite systems and ABM systems. And this is highly destabilizing. And of course, we have a huge program underway to replace our nuclear deterrent forces. The graphic on the lower left is a vendor blurb announcing the exciting B-21 Raider stealth bomber, which is going to be the replacement for the B-2, which turned out to be too expensive to deploy in volume. Presumably, this will be a bargain. I doubt it. The chart in the lower right shows steadily increasing US defense budget expenditures on track to hit a trillion dollars by the end of this decade. That's a trillion with a T. Hegemonic goals are dangerous. If you announce that you intend to dominate any single um, opposite nation militarily or any combination, any alliance, you are looking for trouble. And that is the official policy of the United States, that we will be able to dominate in any domain, in air, in space, on the oceans, in cyberspace, we will be invincible. And that is not a peace-seeking policy. We also engage in first strike threats involving nuclear weapons. According to Daniel Ellsberg's last book, The Doomsday Machine, North Vietnam was threatened multiple times by the US uh, with the use of nuclear weapons. And I'm sure they're not the only ones that have experienced that kind of confrontation. We're also steadily maintaining Un, uh, unstable conflict zones around the world. North Korea is a frozen peace. Iran is threatened because of their domestic nuclear program. Ukraine is a raging war in Europe. And we're making noises about fighting over Taiwan. There always seems to be some part of the world that is a threat to United States national security and a justification for an enormous defense establishment. Abandonment of diplomacy, unfortunately, has characterized the last few decades. And every time you let go of one of these treaties, you make the world a little more dangerous. The ABM Treaty, which restricted the development of missile interceptors, when that was abrogated by the US, the Russians decided that they would need to raise their game 
and build unstoppable delivery systems, which they proceeded to do. They now have maneuvering hypersonic warheads that cannot be intercepted by anything, even the feeble US ABM system. The Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which restricted short range nuclear missiles in Europe, that was abrogated. The US accused the Russians of not complying with the terms. The Russians said, we are complying, come and inspect. The US said, we don't believe you. And now that treaty is gone. The Open Skies Treaty, which permitted aerial uh, reconnaissance by both sides to confirm compliance with arms restrictions, abrogated also. So in addition to ditching these treaties, the US has developed a very selective adherence to international law. We have something called the rules-based order, which changes from day to day. Basically, we make the rules and other people are supposed to follow them. And we're also engaged in illegal economic warfare. A large fraction of the nations of the world are now under US economic sanctions. Of course, that includes Cuba, which goes back decades. And we continue to rely on clandestine actions. CIA is doing dirty work all over the world that general public finds out about a few decades later. And this is not making the world a more peaceful place. Finally, we have our Ukraine proxy war. The graphic shows destroyed US Bradley and uh, German Leopard tanks on a battlefield in Ukraine. And uh, the arms assistance has been escalated. The Biden administration, after saying they wouldn't go up the escalation ladder, climbs another rung. The latest announced one is to give F-16s tactical fighter aircraft to Ukraine. And the ones that are being supplied are nuclear capable. You can load a uh, tactical nuclear bomb on them and deliver it. So one wonders if the Zelensky regime asks for those nuclear weapons, whether Biden will give them because it, they'll be necessary to defend Ukraine. And there is the potential basing of NATO forces in the event that Ukraine survives this war. Perhaps you'll see a NATO military base in, in Crimea. So these uh, proxy wars are very dangerous and destabilizing as they threaten other nations. If Taiwan becomes an armed outpost of, of the US in the Pacific, the Chinese are not going to uh, view that as a peaceful gesture. The US has also concluded a treaty with Australia to supply them with nuclear submarines, presumably to offset China's growing presence in the Pacific. All these are serious uh, escalation risks. Now I'm gonna talk about technological changes that are not in the GPUS platform. And this is a section where, if you will, we look at the dark side of technology, making weapons more dangerous and deadly. I'm going to talk about cyber warfare, information warfare, robotic weapons, and uh, weaponized AI. Cyber warfare is moving battle into the information domain in cyberspace, and it involves developing defensive and offensive weapons. The offensive weapons are especially destabilizing because they're meant to damage other countries' infrastructure to take down their air defense systems, their electric grids, their transportation infrastructure. And when you have something that can potentially interfere with someone's early warning network, you've got a deeply destabilizing technology. Because if the enemy feels they've been blinded, they're likely to make the worst assumption and launch preemptively to offset what they think may be coming. There's also a danger of unpredictable accidental impacts. A while back, the US unleashed a computer worm that damaged centrifuges in Iran that were enriching uranium. And because they attacked widely uh, used industrial controllers, 
the um, worm or virus spread from network to network until it was shutting down industrial machinery in Europe. So you don't want something unleashed on the global internet that's going to do damage outside of its intended targets. Civilian infrastructure is highly vulnerable today. Advanced nations rely on computers to uh, you know, run the ICUs in their hospitals, to deliver power, to help emergency services deal with problems. Anything that uh, disrupts computer infrastructure today is going to have a serious negative impact on society. There are no treaty restraints on this type of warfare. And you're going to see this point, no treaty restraints, a couple more times in this presentation. It's open territory for defense contractors to rush into this field and come up with the nastiest stuff they can think of. And as I said, this is a serious escalation risk. If another country rightly or wrongly perceives that it's under cyber attack, it's going to fight back with whatever it's got. Information warfare. This is a very recent development, largely because of the shifting attention of the world's public to internet information sources. And unfortunately, government agencies have tried to enter this marketplace of information and use it to extend their propaganda machinery. And it's been done in a very stealthy way. Recent uh, journalists have revealed that in the United States, the government has fairly effectively interfered with the content on major social networks. And this takes the form of deplatforming, getting the managers of social networks to throw people off or shadow ban their posts so they're not as visible as they ought to be. And uh, it's quite unsettling to have a government, which our government supposedly under First Amendment uh, guidance, in the business of stifling selected opinions to uh, maintain a propaganda agenda. But even apart from government activity, there is a free for all of enthusiasts and activists and uh, even unst mentally unstable people filling all these channels of information with lopsided, distorted, weird messaging that is actually masking what's actually going on in the world. Today, it takes a determined effort for an individual to assemble reliable information sources on the internet. And the fact that governments are exploiting this new domain is distressing and it's working against peace. Some of the techniques in information, internet information propaganda are creating synthetic individuals, software bots, software that acts like people posting on these services. There's harassment of targeted individuals. There are fabricated images and videos. And there are bogus fact checkers, the people you know who guards the guardians, people who are supposed to tell us what's true news. It turns out that their agenda is distorted sometimes too. Something that's easier to understand is robotic weaponry. These are unmanned weapon systems, and they're being aggressively developed by major nations in several domains. There are unpiloted aircraft. There are robot tanks and armored vehicles. There are unmanned warships, and there are unmanned spacecraft, all designed for a military purpose. Again, there are no treaty restraints on the development of this stuff. It's open season. It's a land rush for a uh, gold rush for the weapons contractors. And unfortunately, there are low barriers to usage. The US government is quite sensitive to military casualties. But if you send unmanned systems into combat, you don't have body bags coming back. You just have piles of junk uh, destroyed. So it's tempting for uh, warlike policymakers to place an emphasis on in introducing as much of this weaponry as they can. 
And lastly, and most frighteningly, we have weaponized artificial intelligence. If you take advanced AI software and, and couple it with robotic weapons, you have weapon systems that can independently decide when to engage, how much damage to inflict. They have the license to kill, basically. This is a, a bunch of software in a robotic weapon that is independently conducting military operations. And potentially, they can function in groups, they can intercommunicate, and they can participate in conflict at progressively higher levels up the decision chain. If an AI can do a great job as uh, an infantry squad, it could do a great job potentially as a division commander or potentially as an army commander or potentially determining when a nuclear exchange should be initiated. This is the ultimate nightmare to have AI systems that are in control of weapons of mass destruction. And the escalation potential is obvious. These machines can think faster and reach program conclusions faster potentially than humans could override them. And they're, as in any software, I worked in the software consulting field for years prior to GPAX and saw many, many occurrences of unexpected bugs and malfunctions in uh, computer software, some of which was developed by the largest and most respected firms like Apple, Microsoft, and so on, because it's very hard to exhaustively test software. Problems can emerge late in the life of software's uh, deployment unpredictably. You do not want unpredictable failure modes in weaponized systems. You do not want unpredictable failure in AIs that control weapons of mass destruction. This is a very serious risk and has terrible escalation potential. And then, of course, we have no treaty restraints. Why would anyone be concerned about weaponized AI? It's the latest and greatest technology. And ultimately, there's an unresolved ethical issue. Who is responsible if an autonomous robot decides to destroy or to kill? Is it the, the field commander who unleashed the weapon? Is it the software engineer who wrote the decision logic in the code as who should live and who should die? The robotic soldier enters a village. Does it know what a civilian looks like? Does it know what a child looks like? Who's responsible if a war crime is committed? Is it even a war crime if there's no human pulling the trigger? These are profound questions. People are beginning to try to organize a policy response. But in the US, as I said before, there are no restraints. The, the Pentagon is actively pursuing research and trying to implement these systems in competition with other major powers. So I've reached the end of my segment on that gloomy note, and I'm going to be handing it over to Ryan Swan, my colleague on GPACS. Ryan is a doctoral candidate at the University of Bonn, and his uh, PhD research involves the impact of advanced technology on, on global security. Ryan, we need to unmute you. All right, I'm here. Okay, I'm going to uh, change the slides on cue that Ryan provides. Okay, perfect. Then thank you so much, Hike, and thank you, Rose. Thank you to everybody who helped organize this event. And it's a real pleasure to be here, albeit uh, virtually from my office here at the Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies in Bonn, Germany. So best wishes to you all from the Beethoven city. Um, I am going to try and go through my portion, which is the, uh, the, the flip side of Haig's very ominous portion. I'm gonna try and get through it in about 20, 25 minutes. So we have ample time for, for questions afterwards. Okay, so let's dive in. I am going to talk about two main points. The first is 
where we are now. Ike sort of covered most of that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about where we're heading. And then I'm primarily going to answer the question or address the question, begin to answer the question, can emerging technologies provide a way out through a revolution in peace affairs, an RPA? I'm going to offer a very superficial uh, preliminary conceptualization of what an RPA might look like. And I'm going to talk about the two principal components, the technical component, and then the component I'm focusing on in my own academic research, and uh, hope to dedicate, or plan to dedicate uh, much of my academic career to studying, and that's the institutional policy component. And then we will, I will turn it back over to Hike, and we'll summarize our recommendations for the for, for GPACs and for the Green Party, or for rather for the Green Party more broadly. Okay, Hike, next slide, please. So where are we today? Uh, we are in a not particularly attractive place, as I think we all glean from, from Hike's portion of the presentation. But why are we there? Well, we're there because of what I call, or what Hike and I call, the militarized national security model. And Hike touched on many aspects of this. I'm going to summarize it a little bit more succinctly, maybe, as a model, a global security model, a paradigm, really, that has become entrenched, deeply entrenched, since, since World War II. And it's a model that grew out of a dominant theory in international relations, realism, which is a model or a theory that envisions the international or casts the international environment as a very ugly place, an anarchic international system in which self-interested states essentially have to compete for unilateral gains and in which under these ugly uh, conditions without any type of higher authority to police them. Essentially, the, the only way to, to maintain security is through strength, primarily military strength. So I'll offer you my definition here, my working definition of, military, of the militarized national security model as essentially the pursuit and safeguarding of national interest by means of strength. Again, primarily military strength, but increase of increasing importance today is the is, is economic component. So essentially, we have a might makes right based model. What have been the effects of this model? Well, Hike touched on, on on a number of them, but I'll just highlight a few of them here in the the post World War II era. Deep seated division, of the international community. Think about the Cold War period, which was followed in the United States by a, essentially a focus on non-state actors and a war against terrorism. And now we're back into a, a new major phase of major power rivalry that is characterized by US, Russia, and China uh, competition, which is getting as already very ugly and promises to get uglier in the future. Persistent military competition immediately following World War II and the, the failure of the Brook Plan, which was a very um, half-hearted attempt to internationalize in nuclear weapons and, and atomic energy. Once that collapsed, we had fierce nuclear arms racing between the US and the Soviet Union in the 1950s, culminating in the thermonuclear weapons and advanced delivery systems, MERV technologies, multiple independent, into multiply, multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles. Uh, once that maxed out in MAD, mutually assured destruction, there was a shift led by the United States to focus on conventional weaponry, whole revolution in precision guidance that uh, began really in the lead up to, to the war in Vietnam, US tested, employed, advanced precision guidance weaponry in Vietnam. Uh, that led to the Bush administration, Bush two administrations, um, 
vision for a prompt global strike, which was a is a conventional, which is a, a system uh, in which the United States government would possess the ability to, within an hour, strike any target in the world with advanced conventional by advanced conventional means. Russia and China have since been made substantial headway in, in catching up and canceling out these advantages. And now we have a new, a new phase of intense competition in the high tech domain, which Hike touched upon in his presentation. Near constant conflict, overt covert interventions, Hike touched on this, so I won't go into detail, steady proliferation of arms around the globe, considerable military related, and this is an important one, considerable military related environmental degradation. Militaries are the largest institutional polluters in the world and are also incidentally not included in Paris Climate Accord uh, monitoring at the request of the United States, I would add. And of course, massive diversion of resources away from productive societal ends. Next slide, please. So where are we heading? Much of the same. As I touched upon, new Cold War between the US and its allies and a increasingly uh, synergistic China-Russia bloc in what the United States likes to label democracy versus autocracy um, conflict, ide ideological conflict, which is of course going to have uh, pronounced implications, including uh, economic. Elevating risk of escalation, Ike touched upon this, so I won't go into detail there. Intensifying arms racing, uh, in the in old domains such as the nuclear domain, but as well also in, in new domains, namely the, the high tech domain, hostile and divided world. I live in Europe and I can see how the, the anti-Russia sentiment here in, in Germany that's that's been sown as a result of of the of developments in Ukraine. And this is going to lead to contentious relations between Western Europe and, and Russia for the foreseeable future for a long, long time. So and we're, we're heading into a deeply divided and uh, tension-filled world. And of course, accelerating climate catastrophe. We have a very small window in which to try and actually make some type of impactful uh, reversion of cor correction of course to prevent the catastrophe of runaway climate change. And of course, these conflicts only move us in the, in the in military competition only moves us in the wrong, for, in the wrong direction, further expediting and accelerating uh, climate catastrophe. Next slide, please. So basically the MNS model, militarized national security model equals no good. And I summarize Basically, I distill three uh, principal critiques of the militarized global security model. The first is that it's anachronistic and dysfunctional. Anachronistic because primitive might makes right logic clearly no longer applies in the era of advanced modern weaponry. Uh, war game simulations, I study them as part of my dissertation research very closely indicate that a US-Russia, direct US-Russia conflict or a direct US-China conflict, even assuming it can be kept below the, the nuclear threshold would be catastrophic if, it, if they involve advanced modern weaponry. So, so the idea that wars can be fought and won in the traditional sense is, is simply anachronistic. It's, it's not possible today all out war between major military powers would result in no winners and all losers. So MNS policy, what, where does that really leave us? This military competition does not, it serves to protract disputes, not resolve them. And the longer these disputes go on, the more dangerous the world becomes. So MNS model is anachronistic and dysfunctional from a purely strategic perspective. Reason two, MNS model is having immediate deleterious effects. And I would say Ukraine as exhibit A. No need to, to go into further detail there. 
Third reason is a very important one. Ike and I claim that the MNS model is unsustainable. Now, why do we claim that? Combination of persistent tension, steady destabilizing, and steadily steady destabilizing arms advancement has produced a long list of near catastrophes. Hike enumerated 12 instances earlier. With continued, with continued tension and further provocative brinkmanship, uh, we suggest that this is akin to repeated play of Russian roulette. Spin the, the cartridge, pull the trigger. Eventually, there's going to be a bullet in, 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 the, in the chamber and catastrophe. Next slide, please. So now we come to the, the really interesting question, which is can a revolution in peace affairs, an RPA, provide a way out of this very unattractive future, which lies before us? Uh, I, we, we enumerate uh, three bullets here, ways in which the, the RPA can, can have effects. I'm really going to focus on the third one here new tools for, for peace agreement verification. Next slide, please. So conceptualizing an RPA. Well, to revolutionize peace affairs, we have to think about what would actually revolutionize peace affairs mean. So what, how, do we, how do we decide this? Well, we look to, I'm actually working on a paper project that, that's attempting to isolate what is it that really is impeding present arms control and, and holding back and, and inhibiting uh, the promotion of peace today. And an important common denominator, if you look at these various inhibitors, is uncertainty. There's a large academic literature that has linked uncertainty to military competition and indeed conflict. Um, uncertainty underlies key drivers of militarism. Again, I've identified four principal ones in my research. These are strategic incentives, industrial incentives, security dilemma dynamic, and political factors. So strategic incentives are just pure uh, strategic decisions that preference maximization of unilateral gain over positive sum gain. Industrial incentives are your classic uh, MIC, your classic military industrial complex considerations, who's profiting from the war in Ukraine, for instance. I alluded also to that fact that uh, the, the military competition is in the economic interest of arms manufacturers, which also exert considerable influence over policy formation, certainly in the United States, but also elsewhere around the world. Security dilemma dynamic is a, was a well-studied phenomenon in security studies and international relations more broadly, looking at basically if I make a decision, or if state X makes a decision to increase its armaments, even if the, even if for purely defensive reasons, state Y may well interpret those as offensive reasons and take countermeasures by virtue of state Y taking countermeasures, state X feels justified in its position to take further defensive actions, which leads to this spiral of essentially arms racing. And political factors. These are, um, for instance, state prestige and so on. Um, but basically, if you, if you look closely enough, uncertainty, all four of the, uh, uncertainty is a common thread that runs through all, all four considerations. Next slide, please. So conceptualizing RPA, we conceptualize RPA as the demonopolization of state control of security relevant information, again, demonopolization of state control of security relevant information. The state has controlled this information for a long time by means of its 
private intelligence networks or national intelligence networks and has used this information to advance national interests and not common interests in, in peace promotion. So demonopolizing this state control of information we feel is a is sort of the foundational component of a revolution in, in peace affairs. Um, its requisite components are twofold. In our opinion, technical capacity, and then the area that I'm really interested in uh, from an academic perspective, and that is optimal implementation frameworks. Next slide, please. So technical capacity, I'm going to run through this fairly quickly so we can get to my sweet spot, the uh, institutional innovation and institutional frameworks. But technical capacity is critically important. You can think about it like new technologies provide the, the, the tools, the practical tools to fashion a, a more peaceful world. Um, new technologies are or a branch of new technologies, emerging technologies that are particularly relevant for peace and are particularly relevant for RPA, which is again, de-monopolizing state control of security relevant information, are lumped under what is commonly called OSINT or open source intelligence technologies, which is the collection of data from open sources to gather actionable intelligence. I'm going to run through a list of just a, a few here, personal devices and social media platforms, satellite technology, which is a very important one, high tech monitoring techniques, and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Next slide, please. So personal devices and social media platforms, obviously there's been an exponential increase in, in, in the use of these technologies by individuals. If you look at our graph here, which I think we started in 1994, you can see the exponential increase here in the use of these devices as of 2022, uh, well over 5 billion users of, of personal uh, or individual mobile um, cellular devices. Modern phones are equipped with, can't, even basic ones are equipped with cameras and other recording capabilities that uh, feature frequently in the news now of cell phone individuals capturing instances of police brutality and so on on their personal devices. So this is certainly furnishing um, important transparency. I, say, I include here the Arab Spring uprisings, which is one uh, academically, or one instance in which technologies have, sorry, okay, one instance in which technologies played, a, personal cellular devices played an important role in spurring on a, an important movement. And this has been studied academically. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So satellite technology, very important. As I mentioned, uh, there have been, this is an area where there have been significant advancements and continue to be significant advancements, but also a real increase in accessibility. That is uh, the price of and financial access to these technologies has, has, be, has made it much more feasible that non-state actors can actually acquire and um, have access to these very important technologies. Um, also some of the technical advances, um, synthetic aperture radar, I won't go into any of that, but there've been significant advances that have made near real-time monitoring of conflict zones, for instance, um, very feasible. Uh, Igor Morich is a postdoc at Princeton University. He's done a lot of really excellent research on this, and I'm, I've been in contact with him and had a chance to speak with him, and he's uh, indicated that there are some very exciting developments on the horizon. Next slide, please. Satellite technology. Okay, so... Yeah, these uh, geopositioning is, is one instance that I wanted to specifically uh, reference. This is essentially the tracking of geostrategic position of, of, of uh, persons or items 
on the Earth's surface, for instance, military infrastructure. This, these technologies can also help determine, for instance, the, the point of origin of a projectile, which uh, could be shed interesting and uh, illuminating light on developments in Ukraine, for instance, where we often don't know based on the media coverage, who fired on whom, when, and so on. Uh, yeah, so I'll close here with, with respect to verification and arms control. I'll uh, conclude this portion with a uh, quote from, from Dr. Morich, who states, uh, provides that uh, satellite monitoring capabilities have the near-term potential to make very difficult, if not impossible, make it very difficult, if not impossible, to establish secret nuclear, nuclear programs or maintain security around existing ones. So again, the, the implications for potential future arms control are immense. Next slide, please. Okay, high-tech monitoring techniques. I'm not gonna go into any detail here, but the cryptographic hash functions, FANEC radiation analysis. The point here is that a common refrain among um, the mainstream academic community is that, oh, it's going to be impossible to regulate state activity in the, in the cybersphere. And I wanted to draw attention to these technologies because I respond by referencing them with, not so fast. We have techniques that can enable monitoring of state activities in, in the cybersphere if implemented properly which we'll get into in, in, in a few slides. Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Again, not gonna go into detail here. The important point to note here is that as OSINT generates ever more information and in, in, in data, the need to process this data in a, in a timely and efficient manner grows. And here, AI and machine learning provide essential tools, what will we'll, we'll prove to be essential tools in analyzing and, and uh, processing this data for, say, in the, 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 the conflict monitoring and, and management context, the, the, the levels of data that are being generated by these new OSINT technologies is simply too great for individual uh, analysts to, to process in any kind of efficient or timely manner. Next slide, please. Okay, so technical summary or the, the, the summary of the technical capacity. What's important to note here, that the, the main takeaways are that emerging technologies are creating really significant, really powerful new tools. Okay. Uh, new and developing technological capabilities are providing tools for generating ever more information pertinent to peacekeeping. So-called fourth industrial revolution is giving rise to exponential growth in available information. This has immediate implications for peace promotion. So again, take away from the technical capacity, very powerful new tools potentially emerging here. Next slide, please. All right, so now we are getting to, 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 the, to my sweet spot, and that is implementation. It has been well established in the economic literature that mere increase in transparency does not necessarily, and in fact, generally does not translate into increased cooperation. So that means we need some kind of mechanism that translates increased transparency into increased cooperation, and ultimately, in our case, a more peaceful world. So what is that mechanism? Well, I tend to believe that it is international, international institutional frameworks, some type of international institution or network of international institutions that can serve as this optimal mechanism. International 
institutionalism was a theory, prominent theory in international relations that emerged in the 1980s as kind of a principle counter to realism, which I referenced earlier. And it basically provides what I more or less just said, which is that international institutions can provide a third party independent mechanism for facilitating cooperation between states via various mechanisms, but one of which is through increasing transparency and providing a platform, an, a neutral independent platform uh, upon which states can interact, thereby reducing transaction costs. So nice idea, but real problems in practice or significant challenges in practice. And I'm going to get into those right now. Next slide, please. Institutional challenges. So what are these challenges? Well, I identify the principal challenge as what I call the agreement problem. And this is essentially that the level of cooperation required for agreement is so low as to be insufficient to solve the cooperation problem. So what do I mean by that? When you have strategic actors, in this case states, you have a situation when strategic actors can voluntarily choose to cooperate or not, what happens in practice, and this has been shown in the economic literature as well as in the international relations literature, what happens is that to the extent they either don't agree, one, or if they do agree, they agree, but at a level of cooperation that's so low that they can't actually solve the problem around which they're trying to cooperate. We see this again and again and again in the arms control context. Again, as I mentioned, this has been covered um, somewhat extensively in the, in the international relations literature and studied in great detail in the economic literature, particularly in the context of bargain theory. So again, down here at the bottom of the slide, the basic idea is that strategic incentives to maximize zero-sum gain potential frustrate positive-sum cooperation. Next slide, please. And so when I said a couple of slides back that major challenges exist, structural challenges exist, that uh, inhibit international institutions from achieving their full potential. I mean that essentially that proposition was formally proven by Roger Meyerson and Mark Saderthwaite, uh, both very prominent economists. Roger Meyerson, professor at the University of Chicago, Nobel laureate in, in economic sciences, one of the uh, principal architects of mechanism design theory worked essentially proved the what was long suspected to be the case, which is that you can't have institutions that both satisfy requirements that are generally considered to be required in with um, status quo institutional frameworks that also can solve the agreement problem. So what do I mean by that? Basically, in essence, they showed that for any institutional framework that, sat at, that, that meets these four standard conditions, individual rationality, non-subsidized, incentive compatible, and Pareto improving, those institutions do not generally, and in fact cannot solve the agreement problem. So that means that if we're going to devise international institutions, or if we're going to rely on international institutions to implement an RPA, we need institutional design innovation. And that's precisely what I'm, I'm interested in spending much of the rest of my academic career working on. Next slide, please. But there are other institutional challenges, and these are 
how to design, assuming we can get around the Meyerson Sater with weight theorem problem, and we can devise institutions that can actually be optimal institutions that, that can solve this agreement problem. Other challenges, uh, other challenges uh, exist. This is how to ensure, probably the most notable of which is how to ensure impartiality, how to devise institution, international institutions that are impartial, that are not subject to external influence, particularly of powerful states. Hike and I have some ideas about this, won't go into those now because it would take too much time, but um, we have some ideas in the works here. Another is how to devise an institution that covers, that has significant competency, an in, in, in institution that's going to monitor international military activities has, is going to have to be a fairly robust institution. So how to maximize effectiveness while minimizing bureaucracy. And this kind of goes to also to the to the ensuring impartiality point. The, the more minimal the, the bureaucratic uh, structure, the more likely it is, or the easier it will be to ensure impartiality. Next slide, please. And then of course there are practical challenges and that is how to fund such an institution, who is going to uh, provide startup capital in order to get such an institution up off the ground and running. Well, I'm also working on a paper on this right now, which explores three possible options. One is what I call the state track, and that would be some collection of, to basically convince one or ideally some collection of states to help sponsor this institution to get it up off the ground and, and, and get it up and running. Another would be, obviously there are problems with that track to, to the extent the institution is reliant upon state funding, uh, the, the uh, challenge of maintaining its or retaining its impartiality is going to, is going to become more difficult. So one way to get around that might be to bypass states and go to NGOs and see if some conglomeration of NGOs might be uh, willing to back this institution and get behind it and provide the, the startup capital problems there also. Um, and perhaps the easiest would be some individual benefactor, the benevolent billionaire scenario. But of course, all three of these tracks um, are going to create impartiality challenges. No way around that, unfortunately. Next slide, please. Okay, so summary of RPA implementation framework. Basically, um, the idea is there. I feel the tools are there, but there are real challenges. There are structural challenges, there are practical challenges that will need to become overcome. So basically, um, I think that um, while, I'll get to that in the next slide. Basically, institutional innovation is going to be a critical component of, of achieving an RPA, if it is to be achieved. Next slide, please. So to conclude, how do I answer the question, can a high-tech, or how do I can I answer the question, can a high-tech RPA provide a way out of the militarized national security model and thus escape its ominous consequences? And the partially exciting, partially underwhelming answer is potentially. Tools are there, I think to achieve a high tech RPA, however, both institutional, and I wanna stress this again, both institute, technical, technological and institutional innovation are going to be essential components. The technological tools are there, they're getting a lot of attention, but they're insufficient alone. We need optimal 
implementing frameworks, whether that's institutions or some other mechanism, that's a critical component that's not getting the, the, the requisite attention, in my opinion. And to me, that's actually going to be the decisive component as to whether or not an RPA can be achieved. So Ike and I propose framing this challenge as an engineering problem, not a political, philosophical, or moral problem where the task is to unite technological and policy innovation to engineer institutional mechanisms that translate increased transparency into increased trust, cooperation, and ultimately world peace. So the, the, the possibilities are there. It's a matter of making them happen. It's going to require broad interdisciplinary uh, co cooperation, collaboration. It's going to be a, a substantial undertaking, but I think the, 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 the possibility of an RPA is on the table, and I think that's very exciting, so I'll end on that uplifting note. Thank you so much. I will turn it back over to Hike now, and he will summarize our um, recommendations for, for the Green Party. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Ryan, for that uh, uh, far-sighted view of the future, a future I hope we can realize, perhaps not in my lifetime, but I think in yours, quite probably. Uh, so what do we recommend at the end of all of this? Um, with regard to the platform, I think it needs to be revised to strengthen the peace pillar. These are dangerous times and peace deserves to be more prominent in the Green Party platform. And uh, many new emerging threats need to be addressed. We need to take a position on these uh, uh, dangers of uh, uh, high-tech arms racing and, and AI threats and so on. It needs to be spelled out in platform. Uh, we uh, need to recognize that we're in a, in a grave emergency. The danger of nuclear war is greater than ever, and the public needs to be sensitized to it and alerted to it. Uh, and green candidates should make this a prominent aspect of their campaigns. And finally, uh, we need to recognize the possibilities on the upside for promoting peace. The technologies that surround us are double-edged. They can make weapons worse, but they can also give peacekeepers and diplomats new tools for securing peace. And this means we need to educate uh, green candidates on these opportunities and the importance of continuing to press for uh, new tools and methods uh, to secure peace. And with that, uh, we would welcome your questions. Um, when you receive uh, the recording, you can um, look at these references. Ryan's scholarship is on display here. He backs up his assertions in a, a very professional manner. So we thank you for your attention. And uh, if you can put your questions in the chat or raise your hands, we'll try in the remaining time to uh, answer as best we can. Okay, we do have two questions. Uh, let me start with Rex Clark asks, how legally could the UN Security Council be reformed? Wouldn't those with a veto just veto any reforms that takes away their veto power. You want to take a crack at that, Ryan? Sure. Yes. And this, this question goes to the, I think, a foundational shortcoming of the UN Charter as currently as currently structured. Uh, the UN Charter is a document that has a lot of let me phrase it this way. It, it provides a solid foundation for a more peaceful world, but it suffers from some a few major shortcomings, and one of them is the veto power of the, the per, Permanent Security Council members. Um, that is going to 
th there's several ways that might possibly be overcome, but they're all going to essentially require the, <laughs> the major powers to agree to accept a new paradigm. And that's what we are, that's what RPA is intended to do is to bring about a new paradigm to, to draw attention to the recognition that the future is very ugly. And as long as the stir, the current paradigm remains in force, the future is going to remain very ugly in which there are going to be no winners and only losers. And if enough pressure can be can be marshaled and, and brought to bear against states, uh, really the United States, I think in the first instance, but, but also the other major powers, um, it's possible that a new paradigm could be embraced and that new paradigm need not be, we wouldn't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel in order to bring about that new paradigm. As I mentioned, the UN Charter provides a solid foundation, but reforms are needed and one would be absolutely uh, abolishing the, uh, rescinding the uh, permanent veto power of the, of the permanent security council members. Our next question is also from Brett Clark. Why did the Minsk agreements fail? Probably a longer answer than we have time for here, but if you could, what if you could summarize and give your thoughts? Well, there's conflicting testimony here, depending on uh, who you trust. Again, the issue of uh, trust is central uh, in, in these types of conflicts. The, uh, each side potentially had something to gain by halting hostilities. The Russians were hoping for stabilizing the situation in the breakaway provinces and avoiding um, uh, the need to invade or engage in a, in a large war, at least according to them. The Ukrainians were hoping uh, for time to reconstitute their military, which had been unsuccessful in immediately suppressing the resistance of the breakaway provinces. There's fairly compelling evidence for people involved in the negotiations that um, the uh, Ukrainian government and its Western supporters were uh, just buying time in order to uh, strengthen their forces. But so little is, uh, is known about the actual motivations of the players, it's very difficult to tell. But it was a major failure of diplomacy, and we ended up in a the biggest shooting war in Europe since uh, the 1940s. Thank you. And Rita asks, where does the United Nations fit into this? <laughs> well, I would say that in a perfect world, all of this could be implemented under the auspices of the United Nations, but it's a very conservative and slow moving body. And I think what will be needed is some demonstration of success of RPA type uh, structure outside the UN, and then it can gradually absorb those mechanisms into its own functioning. This is, there's a lot at stake when nations are juggling national security concerns, and they're not going to immediately implement a radical new method of uh, conflict resolution without some evidence that it's workable and reliable. But the more we can make um, security matters transparent, the more we can produce accurate, reliable evidence on who is doing what, the more willing people will be to put their trust in um, agreements and diplomatic solutions. And uh, the, uh, the power of propaganda, which is what drives a lot of these wars, is largely based on the ability to conceal from the public what is actually happening, what are the true facts on the ground. And the more transparency comes into play, the harder it is to persuade the public to, uh, to back the, uh, 
the conflict du jour. So I think the UN, um, if it sees that there are new mechanisms that are working, will gradually um, incorporate those mechanisms into its own activities. Uh, for example, there's an International Atomic Energy Agency that is a quasi UN body that makes efforts at regulating uh, nuclear proliferation. It's imperfect and subject to influence, but uh, it's a kind of uh, body that uh, when improved through the RPA concepts, the UN could incorporate. Thank you. And as we're running out of time, uh, one more question here that really fits into what the questions have been. And then uh, following that, if you could both make your closing statements. Um, how about regional security councils? Do you think that would be a way of getting around the conservatism of the security council? Do you feel that could be a solution? It's an interesting concept. There are regional negotiations if you take a controversy like the South China Sea um, um, fishing rights or uh, mineral exploration rights, if there were a functioning RPA framework, it could be adopted by the uh, disputants in that uh, controversy, and they could use it independently of the UN to work out a solution. Or if you take the current India-China dispute, uh, the border in the Himalayas, those two parties could uh, refer it to an RPA type organization. The analog is to civil arbitration in legal proceedings in the US and other countries. If the parties decide that going through the legal mechanism is too timely and uh, too time consuming and costly, they can engage an arbitrator. And if Ryan's RPA concepts come to life and function well, then any disputants could turn to these mechanisms without even approaching the UN, and of course, without an armed conflict. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a sobering yet uh, very important workshop. Uh, much appreciated that the effort put into this. I would like to, um, there was a question about whether the uh, slideshow, the PowerPoint, would be made available to, so that participants will be able to look at that. Uh, yes, we will post the slideshow on uh, the Google Docs for GPAX, and we will make a link available. Um, I'm not sure what the most efficient way to do that is, but I'll, I'll get in touch with uh, the, uh, the the AM staff and figure out. Uh, yes, yeah, so I would recommend contact David Doonan. He should be able to take care of that for you. Yeah, uh, we'll post it to Google Docs and contact David. Thank you so much. Um, if either of you have closing statements, please make them. And I know not all of us have, um, uh, you know, um, some of us are muted right now. It may not be heard, but if we can all please give a round of applause to Haig and Ryan for this excellent and important presentation. Thank you both so much. And uh, please, uh, closing statements. Uh, I don't have much to add. I think I've gone on for too long already, but uh. I thank you all for your attention. And I'm looking forward to working with other Greens to uh, enhance the platform and to spread some of the ideas that we've uh, discussed today. Yeah, and I would just second Hike's point. Thank you all so much for your attendance and attention. Thank you, Rose, again, for facilitating this. And yeah, I think it's just these technologies are double-edged. And I think as, as a party, the Green Party can, can play a role in trying to tilt the, the, the balance more toward the peace-promoting edge than the, than the military edge, which is... I think one of the, the critical challenges of our time right up there with climate change, so. Thank you very much.